Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. In today's video, we'll go through the main points of the first two sections of chapter 13 from Wolfson. In section 13.1, we'll talk about general periodic oscillations. And in section 13.2, we'll introduce an important specific kind of periodic oscillations, simple harmonic motion. And the quote of the day, which you can see above, describes simple harmonic motion in general and also can be related to that little ball at the bottom of a curved bowl. The ball is at a stable equilibrium at the bottom of the bowl. Wolfson says, displace a system from stable equilibrium and forces or torques tend to restore that equilibrium. But the system often overshoots its equilibrium and goes into oscillatory motion back and forth about that equilibrium. And you can easily imagine that if I nudge that ball a little away from the bottom of the bowl and release it, it will roll back and forth, oscillating around the bottom. Now, although we will spend most of this chapter dealing with something called sinusoidal motion or simple harmonic motion, it's worth noting now that not everything that oscillates is sinusoidal. Periodic motion is anything that repeats with a predictable cycle. Look at this Japanese fountain. It's a tipped up tube on a pivot that is gradually filling with water. When it fills to the right amount, it tips dumps its water and then goes back up again. This happens periodically, meaning that if we watch its motion long enough, we can predict exactly when it will tip again. Here are some plots of position versus time for assorted periodic oscillations. This one kind of looks square-like, and this one is a triangle pattern. And this one looks random at first until you notice that this wiggly motion repeats. In each case, we define the period, capital T, as being the time it takes for the motion to repeat. The SI units of T are seconds. Now that we've defined the period, we can define the frequency, F, as the number of complete oscillation cycles per second. The equation for frequency is 1 over the period, capital T. Or, if you happen to know the frequency and you need the period, the period is T is 1 over F. The SI unit for frequency can be figured out from this equation, and it is 1 over seconds, or seconds to the minus 1. This is actually full cycles per second, and we have a special name for this in physics, hertz. One hertz refers to an oscillation that happens once per second. And when we get a little deeper into sinusoidal motion, we're going to find it useful to, to define a different kind of frequency. It's still the frequency, but the units are different. This is called the angular frequency, and it's defined as the regular frequency multiplied by 2 pi. The symbol for angular frequency is the lowercase Greek letter omega, which looks like a curly W. In terms of the period, it is omega equals 2 pi over t. The units for omega are radians per second, where a radian, in this case, is not an angle, but it's just 1 over 2 pi of a full cycle. Okay, let's get into the real heart of this chapter by looking at an important example. Here's a mass, M, resting on a frictionless horizontal surface. The mass is attached to a spring, and the other end of the spring is attached to a fixed wall. When the spring is at equilibrium, the mass just sits there. There is no force at this point, and we define the position here as x equals 0. The spring obeys Hooke's law, so if the mass moves to a position x, there is a force on the mass 
of s sub s on m equals negative k times x, where k is called the spring constant of the spring. Since it's a frictionless surface, this is the only force on the mass that's unbalanced, and so it is the net force on the mass. You can use Newton's second law to find the acceleration of the mass by setting f s on m equal to m times a. Remember that acceleration is the time derivative of velocity, or the second time derivative of position. So this gives us a differential equation. The second time derivative of x equals negative k over m times x. Okay, so the acceleration of this mass depends on its position. When x equals zero, the acceleration is zero. As x increases, the acceleration gets more negative. This is not constant acceleration, so we can't solve it using our old kinematics equations. So what are we going to do? We're going to pick a trial solution, plug it into our differential equation, do the derivatives, and see if it works. The trial solution for this case is x equals a times the cosine of omega times t plus phi. X is a function of t here, and there are three constants in this equation, a, omega, and phi. Although we have chosen to use cosine instead of sine, this is still called a sinusoidal oscillation, and it's also called simple harmonic motion. Now, you may be wondering where this trial solution came from. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, back in the 90s, I asked my math professor the exact same question. He said, it's a trial solution, it doesn't come from anywhere. And I wondered how that can be, and I'm still wondering that today. But seriously, this is the way to solve this differential equation in math, and you'll be amazed that it actually works. So, let's do this. This is the mass on the spring. The frictionless surface is not shown, but the force of the spring on the mass is also the net force. So, we end up with this equation for the second derivative of x. This is our trial solution. Let's write down the units of all the symbols in this equation. x is in meters, and it's a function of time. A is also in meters, and it's a constant. Omega is in radians per second, and it's a constant. Lowercase t is in seconds. We call this the independent variable. Phi is in radians, and it's a constant. So we have these three constants in the trial solution. For now, we don't know quite what they are physically, but we'll come back to that later. So let's differentiate the trial solution with respect to time. You might know that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And by the chain rule, the omega in front of the time comes out in front of the derivative. So we have dx by dt equals negative a times omega times sine of omega t plus phi. Now, let's differentiate again. The derivative of sine is positive cosine. So this is still going to be negative. Another factor of omega comes out. Now you have d squared x by dt squared equals negative a times omega squared times the cosine of omega t plus phi. You can rearrange this a bit and note that this whole part here is equal to x. So this can be written as d squared x by dt squared equals negative omega squared times x. So we've solved it. If we set the constant omega squared to be k over m. So the square root of k over m is the angular frequency of the oscillation. As for a and phi, these are arbitrary constants that are set by the initial position and velocity of the oscillation. Okay, here's a graph of the trial solution for position. This graph shows the special case 
in which phi equals zero. I'll talk more about phi later. If you've ever seen a cosine curve before, this should look familiar. It's kind of like a smile. When time equals zero, the position is at its maximum value, which is a. The quantity a is called the amplitude. In fact, it's half of the full range of distance that the mass travels because the mass goes from plus a down to minus a and then back. The time when the mass goes to minus a is uh, it's at its leftmost position. It's such that omega times t at this time is pi. When the mass returns back to its original position of plus a, omega times t equals 2 pi. Note that omega is not an arbitrary constant. It is set by the physical properties of the system. If the spring is stiffer and k is higher, then omega is higher. If the mass is heavier, then omega is lower. And remember, omega is directly related to the frequency of the oscillation in hertz. And it's also related to the oscillation period by this equation. So what about this phi in this equation? So far, we've been drawing the graphs so that phi equals zero, which means the mass was released from rest at position x equals a at time t equals zero. But what if the mass is not x equals a at time t equals zero? The initial condition could include a velocity and the mass could be at any position between plus a and negative a. That is what the phi is for. Phi is called the phase and it describes the starting time of the displacement versus time curve. If phi is a negative value, it shifts the cosine curve to the right, like this. Like the amplitude a, the phase is an arbitrary constant that is determined by the initial conditions. So, setting phi equals zero again for simplicity, we can graph the velocity versus time of simple harmonic motion, or SHM. The velocity is the slope of the position versus time graph. So it starts at zero for t equals zero. You can also see, from the see that from the equation since sine of zero is zero. Then as time increases, the velocity is negative at first. And then it goes back to zero when omega times t equals pi. Note that the velocity is always zero at the turning points of the oscillation when x reaches its maximum or minimum value. And similarly, we can graph the acceleration, which is the slope of the velocity versus time curve. Here we see that when the position was maximum at time t equals zero, the acceleration is at its most negative value. That makes sense because the spring has its maximum stretch at this point and is pulling the mass towards equilibrium with its maximum force. The acceleration goes to zero every time the mass passes equilibrium. Again, because the net force on the mass goes to zero when the spring is at equilibrium. Then, when the mass is at its leftmost position, the acceleration is at its maximum value towards the right. This occurs when omega times t is pi. And all of this is shown nicely on this animation. The top graph shows the actual position of the mass on the spring, which is actually y in this case. The graph below shows the vertical velocity of the mass shown by this red arrow. And the bottom graph shows the acceleration of this mass shown by the blue arrow. Notice that you get the same SHM for a vertical spring as you do for the horizontal spring. The effect of gravity is only to shift the equilibrium position. And SHM is in fact prevalent in many, many physical situations, which we'll discuss in the next video.